You're listening to the Seek, Go, Create podcast, a part of the SGC network for those looking for excellence, moving towards success, and creating something new. And here's your host, Tim Winders. Welcome to season one of the Seek, Go, Create podcast. This is Tim Winders, your host. This is episode four, and we're titling this one Failure and Family, which doesn't sound very exciting, but... We'll see how this goes, and I just want to let everybody know I'm very excited with this episode. I have my wife, Glory, who has agreed to join me, and she's going to give an interesting and unique perspective on this entire topic. I do want to say this, just as a recap before we get started with this episode. This is episode number four, and if you have not listened to them, just to put it in context, Episode one was just starting out discussing our journey and and how in 2013, after being very successful in multiple companies and businesses, living in a resort community, we had filed bankruptcy, were going to become nomads is what we called it, basically homeless. And, and that was the discussion of that journey. We also, in episode two, discussed more the spiritual aspect of my personal spiritual walk and what all it meant during that time and during other times of my life. And episode three was just money in general. And I think that came out very well. So go back and listen to those if you need to play catch up. But in this episode, we are going to be discussing how all of this impacted our family. We had children at the time, and I'll let Glory describe that in just a moment. But we had children. We were, we, they were at very formative ages, high school and moving into college when we were going through the financial struggles that originated in the 2008 financial downturn, but continued on really for almost six to eight years beyond that. So first of all, let me just welcome my wife, Glory. Glory, thank you for joining me. You are most welcome. I think I'm happy to be here. I think this is going to be a vulnerable position. I'm not one that really likes to let people see me bleed, but... Um, we want to be honest here, and maybe it will help some people. So I am happy to be here with you, Tim. Yeah, Glory Green brings up a great point. She, When we started coming up with the thought for this season one, which was basically sharing testimony, background, our struggles, victories, different things like that, and I told her that I was going to be very candid, she was not that excited about it. So... Again, there may be some reluctance, but we just hope that this might be a blessing to someone. Before we get started, though, and because parts of this story is going to be fairly difficult and challenging, I'm going to let Glory just talk about where our children are today and how they have come through these challenges and issues, and then we'll just back up and talk more about what all we came through and maybe what we believe helped us and the challenges that we went through. So, Glory, just brag on our kids right now. Tell everybody what's going on and how they're doing, and and just talk to us about our children. Uh, We are very blessed to have two children. Uh, Our daughter, Dulcie, who is in her late 20s. She's married and expecting um, our first grandchild, which we are over the moon about. We are so excited about being grandparents. And um, she and her husband, Hunter, Um, are, uh, they're both business people, but they also do ministry and, um, it has just been so wonderful to watch how they are following after the Lord. Um, you know, the scripture raise uh, your children up in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. And to see that, um, you know, just play out in front of your eyes as such a, a wonderful thing. Um, she is just a loving, caring, um, very sweet woman and uh, so excited about getting to watch her become a mother. And then our son, Joshua, um, who is in his mid-twenties and single girls, uh, just if there's anybody out there, um, but you got to be an adventurer because he is a very adventuresome young man. He is a photographer and um, has traveled um, extensively. Uh, doing photography, capturing video, um, and uh, and he's done it for um, missions organizations, for uh, businesses, and then just for the fun of it too. Um, and the stuff that he has produced has been 
I mean, I'm his mom and might be a little bit biased, but it is very, very good. So you can find him as J.K. Winders. You can look him up on Amazon, and he's got a couple of books there. Um, but like I said, he's just got an adventuresome soul and, um, you know, some wonderful prophecies spoken over him about being a historian of heaven and that there will be things that he will capture um, on on photograph and video that you know, will just spark people's faith and there will be healings just from them seeing what God's done somewhere else in the world. So very excited about that too. He's also following after the Lord. But as Tim said, uh, you know, they had a great beginning as little children, very stable, but in, in their high school years and, and college for Dulce, um, we were rocked. Uh, with the downfall in the economy, and um, I know it was very tough on them. It made them both grow up very fast, and as a child who also had to grow up very young, you hate for your kids to have to go through so, that. Yeah, let me let me pause you just a second, though, because I want to jump in and do a little bit of dad brag, too, <laughs> um, because I do want to back up, and we're going to share with people a, a little bit of the, the progression that occurred. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing that we want to say is that, and Gloria and I have been discussing this quite a bit lately, and this may be a topic for another day, is there are many things in life, in our lives that can maybe leave scars on our soul and be somewhat, somewhat of a, a wound that might heal, it might not heal. And, and what we're going to talk about, I believe very candidly on this episode, are things that could have left some real damage on the souls of our children, and they may have caused some issues, but we also see where they are today, and we know that in many ways God took that, mm -hmm. just like Romans 8.31, and he used it for good in some way. Yes. And, but I, this is real quick, dad brag here. <laughs> and, and for anybody that interacts with me, I'm a business coach, consultant. I have a very uh, challenging and um, I want to say judgmental mindset. But I, could, I, I just have the ability to find what's wrong with things very well so that I can fix them. And let me just say that our children, our family... We work together as a team on a number of projects. We have a family foundation that we all work together and, and are doing some things to advance the kingdom. Joshua is the one that's producing and engineering this podcast, actually. And our daughter, Dulcie, is the operations person for all of my organization and what I do. So even through all of the things we're about to discuss, I guess we wanted to give you the end of the story, or at least where we are currently, to let you know that things have turned out okay and are doing well now because of what we're about to talk about. So, and I will tell you, both our children are extremely talented in, in their own areas and avenues. And that's not dad talk. I could probably be more critical with my own children than even <laughs> others, right? Yes, we can. So, Sorry, kids. <laughs> anyway, so, all right. So that, that lets you know where they are. Kids are awesome. We know everybody says their kids are awesome and all that. But ours are. And ours are. We know that, and <laughs> we're excited about that. So, so let's back up, Gloria, and let's talk about a couple of things. We are, our children were both born in the early 90s. Yes. And there was a few things that we did that were decisions that maybe weren't popular to some people around us. We received some criticism from some. And uh, just talk about some of those things early on, like homeschooling and just educating them differently. And, and now that you can look back, you can say, yeah, we worked, that worked out well. It didn't work out so well. Just share a little bit about that. Well, I may go back even a step further than that. Um, when I was first pregnant with Dulcie, um, I have a prayer journal, and in that journal, I had asked um, the Lord, I wanted to be able to be a stay-at-home mom, and I wanted Tim and I to have a Christ-centered marriage, and um, at the time, uh, I owned my own company, um, and it was events planning and PR and all this stuff. And even though I worked out of the home, I was not a, I would not have been just a stay at home mom. And um, so the Lord did end up answering that prayer. And, and Tim and I started a business, which he'll, 
probably give all that background at some point. Um, and it gave me a lot of flexibility of being able to schedule my time so that I could do my work after my baby was in bed and, um, and things like that. So that was one thing. And at the time, you know, it was, it was kind of in society where, um, women were feeling like they needed to be more in the workforce and you weren't taken as seriously, maybe if you were a stay at home mom, but it was just something I wanted to be able to do. And I wanted to somehow figure out how to juggle both having a business and being a mom, which we did successfully do that. Um, then when I guess Dulcie was in second grade and Joshua was about to be a kindergartner, um, I just got a really strong feeling that we were supposed to be homeschooling our children. And with Tim's parents being educators, that was not a really popular decision. Um, they didn't understand why we would want to do that. Um, but at the time we were running our, our businesses and we wanted to be able to, um, travel more, take the kids with us. And it was very difficult for them, for Dulcie not to be in school. Attendance was extremely important. And, um, so Tim wasn't totally for it to begin with. And I just mentioned it to him, kept praying about it. And then it just kind of keep, kept popping up to him that, this person was homeschooling and that person was homeschooling. And, and so he was like, okay, maybe this is something we need to look at. So we decided to try it for a year, which we did. And, um, and then I had some health issues. And so the kids actually went back to school the following year. And we found out that they were so far ahead that we didn't have reluctancy then after that, if we, we were didn't mess home- them up, yeah, we, we didn't, didn't mess them up because we were afraid we would homeschool them. And then our kids would all of a sudden, you know, not be able to spell, not do math. And then if they tried to integrate with others, anyway, that seems silly to say now, but we thought we could possibly mess them up. (laughs) But we found out they were actually way far ahead. So um, anyway, later on in their story, um, we brought them back home and homeschooled them. And, um, and that went great. And it was, it was a, a wonderful thing for us because we were able to take them places, take them to business conferences, take them places that kids wouldn't normally go. And so they, they, they learned a lot through that. Um, Talk about, I want to, I want to interrupt because I think this is an important part of the story. In, in a previous episode, I discussed some of my spiritual journey and how I was saved and became a follower of Christ and, and during that time, I shared just a, a little bit about your journey. But what I would like for you to do is to talk about how important and practical our faith was when our children were young. And I also want to say this. We absolutely know that we there are many ways of raising children. Our way is not the way. Everyone really has to seek their own path. Educating your children may or may not be what you need to do. Doing some things we did. We're about to share a few things that we hope you never have to interact with your children on this as far as some financial issues we went through. But talk about the importance of faith and just a few practical examples. I know I've heard you tell some stories before uh, about just prayer and, and the way we sought after the Lord. And was it just on Sundays or... <laughs> Talk about that for a little while. Um, well, I will first have to go back and give you just a little bit of a background on me. Um, I was actually, I had an experience with the Lord at the age of five. And um, it was very real, very tangible. And I believe one reason that that happened at such a young age for me is because the Lord probably knew what all I was going to be going through, not long after that. And, and he was there to be my protector, um, and, uh, and to love me. And so from a very small age, I could envision myself when things uh, got tough, crawling up in his lap and just letting him love me. So I've had that kind of, that father daughter relationship with the Lord since I was really young. And it was not just an on Sunday type of thing. It was, you know, whenever I needed him. Um, so with our children, uh, you know, they'll tell you if they ever fell down and got a boo-boo, we would pray, you know, I would pray over it. It might need a bandaid and we would do that. But the first thing we did was, you know, we just thanked 
Jesus that he was healing their boo-boo. And, you know, we talked about the Lord in our household. So he was, you know, a practical part of our family. I mean, on Christmases, we would have a birthday cake for Jesus. It was not just, you know, about the presents. And I'll tell you something else fun about Christmas in, in just a little bit. But um, so we tried to, um, I guess, walk our spiritual life out in front of our children so that it was a living, breathing thing for them. Um, not just some rules and regulations and things that we had to do on Sunday. So, um, I guess, is that, I guess, I mean, there, there are many people that possibly think if you take your children to church on Sunday, you're checking that box. The box, yeah. As I recall, and tell me if this is incorrect, as I recall, that was not the way our household was, and for many of the early formative years for the children, you were much farther ahead spiritually than I was. Am I recalling it correctly that we were 24-7, not just Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, or correct me if I'm wrong? No, we're pretty twenty four, pretty much 24-7 in whatever we do. <laughs> Work, uh, business. Yeah, you know, we just, it's, um, but you know, that that is actually more of a, um, a Hebrew mindset that everything in life intermingles with everything. It's not compartmentalized like the Roman Greco Roman Greco Greco Roman mindset where, you know, you work Monday through Friday, on Sunday is church, family is in the evenings. Um, you know, and it's all very compartmentalized. Um, uh, we uh everything just intermingles for us. So no, I mean, you're not wrong in that. I want to I want to ask one question about something that you brought up earlier that we didn't realize the impact that this might have but it was just a few things that you learned from reading some books parenting books or you heard from teaching or something like that share what those things are I've heard you tell some people about those um yeah very early on in fact it, I think it was before we even had Dulcie. Um, I had read that it was a really great idea on Christmas when gifts are passed out that you pass them out to the person who is giving them, not to the person who is getting them. So once all the gifts are passed out, um, a person should be sitting there with all the presents that they are about to give and they should be in front of them. And then we would take turns and go from the youngest to the oldest and go around and the focus was all about what they were giving and because of that um, we would take the kids I would take them to the dollar store they would get money out of their own banks you know five dollars or whatever and they would go get gifts for their grandparents and for me and from Tim and and we would take them home I would help them wrap them they were so proud of these gifts that they were getting to give and because the focus was on the giving it it they didn't tear through packages when it was their turn to get because they'd been so focused on being able to give and the joy that that brought. And to this day, both of my children are incredible givers. And I love to see that because I see a lot of kids these days that just, they they don't have that spirit of giving. And so I think that was a great thing that we didn't even realize we were really doing well, but it just turned out wonderfully well for us. It's tough. It's tough in the society that we're in to teach giving instead of taking. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it appears as if a lot of people, adults, children, we have a tendency to want to take instead of give. And I agree that was a great thing that you implemented. And, and, and it was awesome to see that transpire. So, all right, well, let's fast forward. And let's go ahead and and step into some things that are going to be fairly, I guess, maybe uncomfortable, maybe not. I've told the story in a previous episode that we moved in like 01, 02, started a company, a real estate company, and moved out to a resort community. Our children were, I guess they were probably 8 to 10, 10 years old in that in that range in 2002. And I apologize. I know some people might be listening going, this guy's his father and he doesn't know the age. I am i don't really know ages and birthdays or anything. They were That's more like nine and 13. Kind of like my thing. Thank, yeah. So, so please don't 
Don't, Nine and twelve. Yeah. Don't add bad comments <laughs> about. I'm good at a lot of other things. Birthdays and ages are not so good. So, so pretty formative years, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. At late elementary, middle school. Yes. We moved into a gated resort community with golf courses, clubhouses, pretty good size home, and our businesses were doing pretty well. And we were we were living what we considered then to be a pretty good life. And without going into it again, around 2008, we we were hit pretty hard. In fact, very hard with the financial collapse. All companies pretty much disappeared. Assets, revenue, money, everything dried up very quickly. Our children in 08 would have been, I'm going to do this math good here, oh 18 and 15 probably something like that Woo-hoo, i got it right <laughs> come on give me a give me a little give me a little love here <laughs> that i know the ages of my children and and what happened over the next five years between 08 and 13 as we saw our income disappear businesses disappear we were going through foreclosures we were going through bankruptcies and all of that was during a time that we had a daughter that was attempting to go to college mm-hmm a son that was homeschooled, but moving towards the end of his high school and trying to determine what he was going to do next. And I want you to, as best you can, Glory, just to attempt to tap in some things that were going through your mind at that time. Well, first of all, going back to the time when we moved out to the lake, um, you know, the kids, myself, you know, we could go to the clubhouses and charge meals to our member account, um, get out on the golf courses. Uh, we had a boat on the lake. Um, I mean, it was a very nice life, uh, very blessed. And, um, you know, after 2008, 2009, and things got tight and the money wasn't there and bills were stacking up, you couldn't go to the clubhouse and charge because you just couldn't. <laughs> You know, there it wasn't there. So um, life began changing for the kids. It was um, starting to be different for them. Um, we were never parents that gave them everything that they wanted. And I've never been a real name brand person. So, you know, I didn't have to have this brand or that brand. Um, but it, you know, it also got really difficult when it was getting hard just to go get anything. You know, and having to tell the kids no a lot. And then Dulcie was getting ready to go to college and was like, you better be going for that presidential scholarship. And you, you know, let's uh, make sure that you've taken the AP classes so you can get rid of some of your course credits that, you know, you need to have. And, um, I mean, it was just a, a very different way of life than what we thought we would have. However, the Lord had been dealing with us for a couple of years because, you know, even in our heyday and success, we were like, Lord, we just want you to use us. We want you to use us. We want to make a difference. We want to be impactful. And, um, one of the messages that we kept getting was you've got so much stuff. I can't send you anywhere. I I want to send you, but I can't send you anywhere. We're like, well, we'll clean out. We'll get rid of some things. But we didn't realize really how much the stuff was controlling us. Um, I don't think God matter. It does not matter to him about us being prosperous or having things. But what matters is if those things have us and do they, how much energy and, and mind does it take to, you know, keep things up? Are they a blessing or are they a burden? And I think a lot of our things had become a burden and an anchor to us. Um, so it, it was really interesting. I mean, I guess we were, we would have been, I I guess materialism was, you know, a a way of life. Just. It was probably, listen, most, most people have some degree of control of materialism there. I actually just had a thought and maybe you can dovetail this into what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that there are probably people listening to this that might, I don't even think take offense would be the right word, but like they might be going, you know what, we've lived pretty tough our entire lives. We've never seen country club living and Mm -hmm. things like that. 
N- neither and had we. <laughs> neither had we. Yeah, we were like we were like the clampets pulling in there. We won't get into details there, but literally the U-Haul broke down at the gate of the uh, country club. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we understand that, and mm-hmm. and I guess, I, I guess what I want to make sure of is, and Gloria and I have talked about this. I'm not sure if what we went through financially was tougher because we were at a certain point and then went to it wasn't zero, well below zero, (laughs) or if things are relative, or if it was just our journey. Journey. And so we're just sharing it in that way. And I I guess I want to say, especially with, you know, the way we commented, and then we're about to let you know that we became, you know, homeless and what it did with our children while they were finishing up college and different things like that that we're in no way saying it was harder because we went from there to nothing, but it was just our journey, and that's really what we're looking to share here. Do you have any comments on that? Does that, does that matter one way or the other, Glory? Well, I mean, I definitely in, in no way mean to offend anybody or anybody to think, ah, oh, well, they've just always had it. You know, they were born with the the golden spoon in their mouth or the silver spoon, whatever it is. Uh, neither one of us were. Uh, Tim and I both came from extremely humble. I, I um, had a I had a KFC sport. That's what sport. I had in my mouth. <laughs> we were KFC people. Oh boy. <laughs> that was that bad? No. <laughs> um, but Tim and I, I think, had both come along. Um, you know, as children of the 60s, that we were going to do it better than our parents had done. I think that's what the, the, um, what is our, what generation are we? We're the last of the baby baby boomers. boomers. We're the last of the baby boomers that we're going to do well and impress. And then we were. We could work hard enough to to do anything. And I shared this in another podcast. I believe it was in episode three on, on money that we were also fueled by the 80s when our formative high school and college years, which was even more go, 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 succeed, succeed. And that was really what we were a product of. We, you know, we thought we should impress people. We thought we should Mm -hmm. go big or go home. And and there's nothing wrong with things. There's nothing wrong with abundance. There's nothing wrong with success. It's just our perspective has changed. I think one of the reasons that I shared the difference in lifestyle there was probably to get to the point and, and we'll backtrack in just a minute of some of the things that we had to go through to get there. But now, with all four of our family mem- members, which is really, really cool, and our, our daughter's husband is, is in the same mm-hmm. mindset, um, I wouldn't even call ourselves minimalists. I would call ourselves essentialist. And we have learned that if, if it is not essential as a tool to help us with our gifts and talents to become whatever it is that we are supposed to be. Um, if it is not essential for that, then we probably don't need it. Mm-hmm. And it is extremely freeing. Let me just say, it might not sound freeing to you, but it is extremely freeing. And this has come from somebody who had, um, I had a room in our home that was my craft room. I had every little craft gadget you could think of. Um, I had every kitchen cooking gadget you could think of. And um, not that any of those things are bad. They're not. If you were using them in a good positive way but if they're just sitting there collecting dust then they've actually turned into a burden for you instead of a blessing so our family um it's really cool how we all became kind of that essentialist we all started pairing things back around the same time and i think that the struggles that we went through were probably the catalyst that made us go there but we all really really like it now and we're all glad that that is our mindset now and it is, like I said, just been extremely freeing for all of us to think that way and to accumulate that way as essentialists instead of just accumulating. Between 08 and right around 2010, we saw income disappear, businesses disappear. We gave real estate back to banks. We split up businesses with partners 
closed down coaching companies, basically saw income go to zero. We were sitting in a five, 6,000 square foot home at the time, and our children had to have known what was going on. What was the stress like for you then, and how do you think it related to our children during that time? It hurt. The pride and the ego very much took a big hit. I mean, you want your kids to think that you're awesome. And and if they had thought we were awesome, now they're looking at us going, uh, mom, dad, come on. Because they didn't understand what was going on in the market as well. And that there were a lot of other people out there having some of the same issues. It was very personalized to them. And when you're sitting in it, it's it's very personal to you. Uh, they can tell you that there's other people going through it too, but when you're the one that it's affecting, it, it's a whole different thing. You're embarrassed. Um, there can be, you know, anger. Uh, one of the things that I, I really had to make a very conscious decision. I could, my tongue could have lashed out at Tim. I could have called him all kinds of things. I could have blamed everything on him. Not that it was all his fault. It wasn't. Um, we all had participated in the lifestyle and the businesses and stuff like that. But I remember specifically one day sitting in, he had called me into his office and I was sitting across from him in a chair. And I think he was just letting me know that, you know, there is no more money to continue paying house payments. He's done all that he can do. And now it's just, you know, uh, probably a matter of time. And we're going to lose the house. And I remember just, I remember feeling this immense heat in my body because I was just so angry and I felt so trapped and that there was nothing I could do. I didn't know what to do to make it better, to fix it, um, to protect me, to protect the children. And, and, and I probably did feel a lot of anger. But I just remember thinking, if I open my mouth right now, I'm going to say something that could very well damage our marriage from here on out. So what is more important to me? This man in our marriage, or that we're going through this right now, and this could get better. And I decided that my marriage and this man was way more important, and so I just kept my mouth shut. And that was a very hard day, and I still remember it to this day to this day and I'm tearing up as I'm saying this because I knew I had a choice at that point and I could not just say what I wanted to say and I'm sure Tim could have probably let some things fly at me too and he never did he kept his calm he kept his cool you know and never said that um I, I also you know just talking about the stress and strain I remember waking up one night and Tim wasn't in bed and I'm like where is he and I so I thought, well, maybe he's up in his office or something. And I walked to his office. He wasn't there. He wasn't on the sofa. I kind of crept down the stairs. He wasn't sitting downstairs on the sofas there. And I ended up finding him. Um, our daughter was at college at the time. But he was in her bedroom, which I think was probably the furthest point in the whole house. And I think he had just been down there crying. And because when I sat down with him and, you know, we cried together and we prayed together <clears throat> but the thing that I remember when I couldn't find him at first was, has he done something to himself? Has he thought that it would be better if he just took his life and we had insurance money and that that would be better than him being here with us? And um, that was a horrible feeling to have that kind of grip. This may lighten this a little bit. Unfortunately, we didn't have insurance at the time, so that wouldn't have been a good. <laughs> and some of this, the plan is, is the next episode is, if I can get Glory to join me on that one, is <laughs> to talk about uh, marriage and the impact of these type of situations. Obviously, we're getting into a great deal of that now. I do want to say this. Some of the things that Glory brought up are important, and, and I want to speak directly to fathers right now, because I, I know what was going through my mind. There's a scripture that says, if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an infidel. And that scripture is tough to hear 
when you're going through times like this because there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of embarrassment. There's a lot of what have I done to fail? I do believe there's a deeper layer to that scripture, by the way, not to get into it. I think it's actually speaking also about a heavenly father and that what we are to do is really to look at our heavenly father as a source and as an earthly father it is many times difficult for us to provide in some of the up and down times that we see so that's not putting it off but it's maybe a little bit of an explanation there but i will say from a father standpoint i felt failure there was no doubt i felt as if i had failed my wife my children, and I don't know if it was better or worse that we had kind of moved on up the food chain and were looking, looking, we joked, we, you know, we looked good, smelled good, dressed up real well. We, we were looking good and smelling good and all, living in a country club, and we were in really rough shape. So during that time, though, and we'll, we'll kind of start wrapping this up, I want to ask Lori, and it could be at some point that I can actually interview the children and ask their thoughts on this, but we had a daughter that was in college during this time, and and we know that this created some struggles. It, it caused some challenges, and we'll talk about our, our son in just a moment who was finishing up his high school years and considering what to do next, but talk about just your observations and and and, and how this could impact you know, someone that was college age during that time? Um, Well, as I said earlier, I think this made the kids grow up a little bit faster. Um, Dulcie actually graduated college in three years instead of four. And part of that was just financial. I I remember her asking you, Dad, I could take lighter loads and just stretch it out over four years or I could push it and go ahead and get ready done in three. What do you think I should do? And I remember you saying, um, Dulcie, if you're paying for it, which one do you think would be better? Oh, I guess the three years. Yes, correct. So, and that's what she did. And she, I mean, she put a lot of work into it, but she graduated in three years. I do want to interrupt you one Mm -hmm. quick thing, because some people are probably asking, how did college occur when there was no income? She got scholarships. There were a few loans. She worked. She worked, but I do want to say one other thing, and I think this is the Lord's hand in situations. We do not think that the Lord brought our financial situations on us, but an important scripture for me is Romans eight thirty one. God works all things together mm-hmm. for the good of those that love him, and we definitely love him, is that because our financial picture was so bleak while she was in college, she was able to get a few other assistance type things that helped that kept her from possibly accumulating even more student loans Mm -hmm. during that time she still did accumulate some and and we're really excited to say that she's actually almost gotten those paid off just a handful of years later but i do want to say that because some people are probably trying to do the math and say how can someone go to a college college is way overpriced we don't have to get into that on this (laughs) one but But anyway, uh, so Glory was bringing that up, and I just wanted to share that quickly to say that there was some small Mm -hmm. blessings along the way that that our poor financial situation (laughs) helped when you fill out financial aid packages. Plus, she was a smart kid, so she did did very well. Great student. She she did work study, um, you know, where she she, she was paid at school, and but one of the things that I think this did for her was that when she graduated, she still, you know, had the dream of being an adventurer and going out and traveling. Um, And so she's looking at us going, well, mom and dad aren't going to be sending me to do that. And so she started researching things that she could do, and she ended up applying to become an au pair, Um, which for those people, you know, if you don't know what an au pair is, it's basically a, a nanny. Um, part-time so you work like 20 hours a week for a family you go live with the family in a foreign country usually you are paid for your services um, and then you get to travel some that that's the 20 hours a week thing so that you actually have time where you can actually go travel and see the country and learn about it and and all that and Dulcie had always wanted to live in Italy so she actually found a family in Rome and right out of college she moved there and I'm trying to think 
maybe late summer, fall, and was there for six months. She took a six-month position. And so I think if she had had a home to come to, it would have been really easy just to come home and, you know, send out resumes and look for a job and... Come back to mom and dad. Yeah, take her time you know, finding what she wanted to do, but she didn't really have a home to come back to. And she knew that. So she, you know, it forced her to do something different. So she ended up doing that six months in Rome and then met someone there who had worked for a family in Australia. And the girl connected Dulcie with the family. And she then went from Rome to Australia and lived a year in Australia with this family and um, was an au pair for their son and also ran the household for them. And uh, worked in the mom and dad's businesses. She got so much um, great experience from doing that. Plus, I mean, she lived in Italy. She lived in Australia. Not that many people get to go do that. And so that was a really great thing for her. And it also fed into that essentialism because when you're going overseas for periods of time like that, you can't take everything with you. You have to take the essentials. Yes. Pack a bag. Pack a bag and go. Um. So that that was kind of, I think, you know, with Dulcie. I, I know I, I've talked to her recently about it. And she says that there are things that still make her tear up when she thinks about the 90s and early 2000s of, you know, the struggle that we went through. And it still does bother her soul some. But the older that she's getting, the more she's understanding how the markets. And it wasn't just mom and dad failing. Um a lot of people were having trouble at that time. So Yeah, though you said the 90s and early 2000s. I think you meant the late 2000s up into oh, the yes. early two, 210s because yes. people are going to say, "Wait, what happened there?" Yes. But, Sorry. So so this is something that we don't really know. Mm-hmm. But do you think that our daughter would have traveled overseas if everything was still clicking along and smooth and we were in the financial position we were in in 0708? hard to answer that but it is hard to answer that but i think it was a big catalyst to get her there quicker because during that time that she made that decision and when she went to italy Mm -hmm. we were living in the situation where a sheriff could knock on our door at Mm -hmm. any time and we could be evicted yeah so not necessarily like a nice comfortable environment even though it was still a big home we were starting to get rid of furniture and things like that. well and in fact she came home for um Like two weeks, I think, in between Rome and moving to Australia. And we were actually finishing up the packing of everything because we knew come July we were out of the house. And so it did give her some time to come back and make sure, you know, what few things that she wanted to keep that she had done that. So we were in a yeah. five, six thousand square foot home with basically nothing. <laughs> no, we, nothing had, we had sold and given away. And um, so that was a big yeah. impact on her. Let's mm-hmm. talk a little bit about our son mm-hmm. yeah. who in, you know, about the time that we were going to be homeless and he graduated. Home. He graduated in uh, the beginning of May. And then we were, and then June, he packed up everything that he had in his little car, and he moved at 18 years old to Los Angeles. He did not have a job. He had some friends that lived out there who had said that he could sleep on their sofa until he found something, and it was breaking his mama's heart. I mean, I was excited for him that he wanted to get into film, he, he wrote scripts in high school. He was always filming things and editing and coming up with just tremendous pieces of work. And and so he thought that's what, you know, he was going to do with his life. And, and at the time, the industry was changing so much that even if you researched should your child go to film school, it was saying probably the best use of your money, if you had any, was to um, actually just fund their first project instead of sending him to film school. So Joshua decided that he was just going to go to LA and see what would happen. So 18 years old, he grew up really, really fast. Um, and I, I remember it was probably August. Yeah, probably the end of August. I remember him calling us and saying, I have no place to sleep tonight. I don't know what to do. And 
I was just beside myself. And we couldn't get him a hotel room because he had to be 25. And they wouldn't let us call and even give a credit card number. I mean, we tried, we tried everything we could think of to try to help him. And we couldn't help him. And he actually slept in his car. I felt like the biggest failure for that. But it was funny talking to him later. He was like, you know, that was my biggest fear going down to, out to L.A. was what if I end up homeless and I have to sleep in my car. He said, but after I did it two nights and I went to the YMCA and took a shower, I was like, man, if I could do this, I can do anything. And it wasn't long after that. I mean, he only did that for a, a few nights. And then another friend, he ended up staying with him. And then it worked out that he got an apartment that he shared with a bunch of other guys. And, and um, you know, and, and did some work out there. But... I know for sure Joshua would not have just packed his car up and gone to L.A. at 18 years old had he thought he had other options. Yeah, Joshua was the one in the position to sit in his room when a sheriff would knock on the yeah. door and give us an eviction notice. And there's no doubt that he heard a lot of the conversations about the details of bankruptcy, the details of foreclosure, the details of... What are we going to do with our stuff? What are we going to do with these things? What are we going to do to get rid of this stuff? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do to store a couple of things? And there's no doubt that he heard all of that. And I do want to say this about the story Glory just told. I don't know. I am sure that there are lower points for a father to be in. But I can't think of many for a father to have to coach their son on where to park their car to sleep in mm -hmm. overnight and not being in a position to do anything about it. Yeah. And I, that, I, I can't, I'm sure there's worse. And I'm, again, there could be many, many situations that are worse. But for me, I still recall that conversation and how challenging it was. What Glory brought up, though, is very significant. The man that Joshua is, mm -hmm. and I say that with firmness, the man that he is today at a fairly young age, at a time when some of his peers are still in adolescence, is very significant because he makes decisions and he does things. And we, we, we help and we do things with our children, okay? We're not saying that we... Even though it sounds as if we kicked them out, we had to. We didn't have a choice. I, I used to joke, and this is not a funny joke, that if your children don't have a home to come back to, they'll figure things out, and ours did. And that's, that's a sad way of making humor of something that's very serious, I think. And, but we're in a time where we've got these odd things in society where people are so comfortable that they don't know how to deal with adversity, but yet a lot of people are dealing with adversity. So it's a, it's a, it's a weird place that we're in. And the thing that I want to say that I'm grateful for, and and that is this, we were able to, as a family, with the guiding hand of our heavenly Father, make it through all that. And I do want to say this: there are many stories that we have not shared. <laughs> and there are many that will never be told about what we were doing to juggle things financially. And we got help from some of our family at times. And then it didn't make sense for that to happen. And just so many things going on. But this, I believe we can say with conviction. We made it through an extremely difficult time in our journey. And we did it. Number one, because of our Heavenly Father. Number two, because we had a resolve to stick it out together. Mm -hmm. And Gloria and I will speak about that more when we talk about marriage in, in an upcoming episode. But it would have been so easy for any of us to quit. Whatever quit means, mm -hmm. to get mad at God, get upset at God. And we did get mad at God during this time. We had a lot of interesting discussions with God, but... I, today, hate all that we went through, but I'm so pleased with where we are 
mm-hmm. as a family. And I believe that maybe that was the message that I would have liked to have shared with yes. us going through this. Glory, would you like to add to that? Yes. I mean, I think you said earlier, God didn't bring this on it, on us uh, to teach us a lesson. But I think since we were going through it, he said, while we're here, why don't we learn something important? And Tim and I both, um, we have that type A personality. We can work hard. We can make things happen. Control. We can control. And we had, I guess, always thought that if we work hard enough, you know, we can achieve anything. And I think what God was trying to tell us was maybe just let me be in control and work when I tell you to work and how I tell you to work. And number one, it probably won't be quite as hard as you're having to do. And number two, I can bless it. And number three, it'll be going where I want it to go, not where you think it should go. And had we not gone through some of the issues that we'd gone through, and it humbled us, and it made us go to the Lord and say, Lord, obviously we did not have this all right, so what needs to change? What thought, process need to, what thought processes need to change? What actions need to change? What words need to change? Tell us. Because the one thing I am happy that we never did, you, you said that we got mad at God. I don't know that we ever got mad at God. We were mad and we fussed. We were mad at the situation. We were mad at the situation and we fussed. And we might have said, why, God? We don't understand. But I don't think we were ever either one mad at God, like thinking that he had brought this on us. But the thing that I'm thankful that we've never done is we've never questioned him. If something wasn't working, we always knew he was God. His word was true and he was good. So if it is not working the way the word says it's supposed to work, what did we miss? Because we need to backtrack and we need to look at how we did it because there was obviously something that we did not do right or didn't understand or whatever because he is always faithful. Yeah, that's good. So we're going to wrap this up. I believe you'll be able to tell this was unscripted. (laughs) It may seem as if it bounced around a little bit and Truthfully, we had a few notes and we discussed it and we wanted to share a few things. Our desire is to just hopefully this blesses someone that's going through it or seen it or you learn something from it. We, we do want to say, like I just said a few minutes ago, that we are very excited about who we are and where we are now. And we would never wish, I've said this repeatedly as this first season has unfolded on the podcast, we would never wish what we've been through on anyone else. Would rather not have wished it on our children, but they were with us. They're our children. They couldn't choose different parents along the way. But we are excited about where they are, where we are, all that we learned, our relationship with our Heavenly Father through that, our relationship with each other. Mm -hmm is very mature and we're just excited about that you know the thing that just kind of popped in my head and and this is what i would encourage whatever you are walking through let love reign because we chose to let love reign in our marriage instead of pointing fingers or what or whatever we walked in love with our children and asked them to walk in love with us um, we tried to continue to receive love from the Lord. Uh, I, I would just encourage you to try to walk in love, whatever the situation is. That if it's with children that have been wayward, if it is with a spouse, if it is with family members, it, whatever it is, just just try to show grace and love to the people around you because. Isn't that what Jesus said? Love the Lord with all your heart and love others as you love yourself. So also try to love yourself. Give yourself some love too. That's good. Thank you, Glory. You're welcome. She reluctantly joined me and I think this has been excellent. I do want to let everyone know that there will be somewhat of a continuation of this on the next episode. We're going to record it somewhat later, but the next episode will be Glory and I discussing our marriage and relationship in relation to all that we've been through. And we have 
been married for over 30 years. Yes. We've been together for 30 three, three. four <laughs> at, at the time <laughs> here and and it's been awesome every day right <laughs> yes <laughs> so we'll discuss that one on the next on the next podcast episode thank you so much for listening in we hope that us sharing these these i guess these difficult things that we went through has been helpful for you see you on the next episode Thanks for listening to this episode of the Seat Go Create podcast, a part of the SGC network. For those looking for excellence, moving towards success, and creating something new. We are constantly discussing bold new topics and ideas here on the network, so be sure to subscribe to be notified when we post new episodes. We look forward to sharing more with you next time, but until then, enjoy the journey.